I could not agree with Dr. Talaj uh, more, especially when it came to his last slide that it's all about the eye of the beholder. Uh, it depends on from which angle you're looking at the patient. So um, let me go through uh, the, um, the, the talk was supposed to be about uh, mechanical circulatory support in acute MI. But uh, I wanted to change the, t uh, the title a little bit more um, to uh, science and of hemodynamics, mainly because uh, I was granted some extra 10, 15 minutes. So um, I took advantage of it. No relative disclosures, although I must say that uh, we're working on a, a surgical bivat, um, actually outside UAV system in California, but uh, that's irrelevant to my talk. So I'm not going to talk about that. So when it comes to acute MI patients, especially with cardiogenic shock, one thing we have learned over the last decade or so is that uh, it doesn't matter how much we come down on the door to balloon time in terms of mortality, either in acute MI patient or in cardiogenic shock patients. We can bring down the door to balloon time to less than 60 minutes, less than 45 minutes. In fact, there is a number of good studies from NCDR database, which is real world, that uh, the outcome of patients who had uh, door to balloon time less than 60 minutes was just as good as, or I should say, I shouldn't say good, but they were very similar to those who had a door to balloon time of 60 to 90 minutes. And uh, this uh, paper, which was recently published about uh, four months ago in New England Journal and was presented at TCT uh, this, uh, last year, I should say 2017, was uh, really the NAS, in my view, the NAS, last nail on, on the coffin when it comes to uh, uh, shaving off the door to balloon time. There is no question that time is muscle in the setting of acute coronary syndrome. But there comes a point that we can go as fast as possible, yet the outcome is the same. So in this, uh, in corporate shock trial, they looked into the patients who came in with uh, acute MI, this was not, uh, this, th th these were all legitimate ST elevation MIs who uh, were in cardiogenic shock, defined exactly by the definition that Dr. Talaj uh, just, just gave a very elegant talk. And uh, they uh, re looked into the patients who had multi-vessel uh, disease, and they looked into uh, opening all the vessels versus only the culprit vessel. And surprisingly, at least to us, because previous, all the prior data up until this uh, ran, truly randomized controlled trial always pointed to the fact that the more you open, the better the outcomes. And all the registers showed the same, but surprisingly, all-cause mortality, which I think is a pretty good hard endpoint. I mean, nothing beats mortality when it comes to any, any clinical trial, was better in patients that the investigators only opened the culprit vessel, not all the vessels. So uh, that raises a question, what we should do for patients who are in cardiogenic shock then, especially when, when they come uh, in, in acute MI. Now, again, remember, I, I want to go back to this, uh, to this substrate, substrate that uh, Dr. Talaj sees the patients and I do. Usually the patients that uh, a heart failure specialist usually deal with is patients who have extremely remodeled left ventricle, oftentimes biventricular failure, and uh, the LV is dilated, the LA oftentimes is dilated. They may also have, because of the years and years, decades of uh, heart failure, they may also have valvular heart disease and atrial fibrillation on top of that. In the setting of acute MI, it's different. This may be a patient who was considered healthy until half an hour ago. Maybe the only medication that they took was one multivitamin, and that was it. And now you're, you're dealing with a patient who has Geogra uh, geometry, uh, it, when you look at the LV, it looks normal. It's not dilated. And then all the parameters that we look into uh, in this patient population is completely different than a chronic heart failure patient. So the devices are obviously balloon pump. Everybody talks about it. Tandem heart is one of those devices that is, um, in general, even among interventional cardiologists and inter interventional heart failure specialists, has not been focused as much as I think should have. Uh, Impella, which um, we're going to talk about quite a bit, and VA ECMO. I know that uh, you have spent quite a few hours uh, on uh, ECMO in general, now either peripheral or central, and you're going to continue to spend another day tomorrow. So I'm going to go a little bit in more detail, not too detailed, about the pressure volume loop. Um, 
I personally believe that uh, anyone who wants to practice in the, in, in the intensive care unit, either cardiac or non-cardiac, has to have at least some basic familiarity with pressure volume loop. This was uh, probably one of the most important legacies of the late Dr. S uh, Sagawa uh, in, in, at Hopkins. He was able to uh, put the two very distinctive um, relationship in the, in, the, uh, in, the, in the ventricular function. Mainly, most of his research was uh, focused on the LV, but that also applies to right ventricle. That he was able to combine the LV pressure and LV volume together. And essentially, what this uh, loop shows you is the relationship between the pressure and volume and flow. Because we oftentimes, we, all we talk about, either our rounds or even when, the way that we think is that what's the blood pressure of the patient? And I oftentimes uh, tell my colleagues, my residents, fellows, medical students said, when you tell me that someone's blood pressure is 100 over 60, all you're telling me is that the blood pressure is 100 over 60. I don't know if this patient is in cardiogenic shock, or this is a patient whose normal blood pressure is 100 over 60, or this is a hypertensive patient who's taking four medications and now his blood pressure is 100 over 60. Doesn't tell me whether the patient is perfusing the organ or not, because if you think about it, and in, fa in fact, when you, when you study the evolutionary biology of the heart, heart as an organ is evolved over billions of years to generate flow. And this is the beauty of this curve. It tells you everything that you know about how the heart is, how, how the ventricle, either the left ventricle or right ventricle, is working and uh, how much flow it can put out. So let's go through the, these four corners and then we wrap it up very quickly. The, remember that the heart at the end of the day is an organ that has to be filled with blood and then ejects the blood. So at, point, uh, at, at this point, the ventricle starts to generate pressure, and there, there is a point in, 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 in every systole that pressure is going up, but both the mitral valve and aortic valve are still closed because the pressure is high enough to close the mitral valve, but it's not high enough to open the aortic valve yet. So this is a phase that we call isovolumic uh, contraction. Until the aortic valve opens, at this point you have ejection, and once the ejection is done, the aortic valve closes, and then you have isovolumic relaxation. Again, this is a point in time that the pressure in the left ventricle is still high enough. Uh, it's, it's below the aortic valve, but it's not below enough that the mitral valve can't open. So this is, at this point, the, the diastole has already started, but there is no blood coming into the ventricle until at, 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 uh, when the mitral valve opens here. And this cycle keeps going on and on and on. Now, this may seem like a very simple illustration of just how the heart works, but here's really the important part. When we think about um, everything in, in, in fact, everything in universe is all about energy, right? And when it comes to heart, the bioenergetics of the heart is extremely important. So the total mechanical energy is um, oftentimes, we, we, we have, in fact, we have wasted decades of uh, investigation, or I shouldn't say wasted, but we have learned through decades of investigation that what we see on echocardiogram, for example, is just how the heart squeezes, how it goes into systole and diastole. But this is just the, the, the piece that our eyes can see. Most of the energy, if you consider this as a weight that is uh, being released from here and is hitting the building here. This is a the total potential energy before it's released. And once it does the work, that's, that's the kinetic energy. That's the systole and diastole that you see on the, on, the, on the echocardiogram. But even after the work, there is a lot of potential energy that is still left. But you do not appreciate that because what your eyes can see is that if the building is coming down, not how much energy is still left in, in that ball. And this is exactly what has happened over uh, somewhere between 1920s to roughly about 1960s when Dr. Sugawa started working on his pressure volume curve studies, that um, people could measure uh, the total energy of the heart, but every time that they looked into the pressure volume loop, they were always underestimating the total, mecha total mechanical energy until we discover that the, uh, this stroke work is just part of the energy that is important we have to focus. The potential energy is still left even at the end of systole. Now, the one thing that may be surprising to many of us is that most of the energy of the heart is, in fact, 
invested in diastole, not systole. Because if you think about it again from evolutionary standpoint, muscle as an organ is evolved to contract. In order to relax, it has to use ATP to break the actin and myosin and then relax the muscle. So, the, the, and oftentimes, if, if you ask, especially medical students, residents, they're confused about this, but the best example to give them is this. When someone dies, they go to rigor mortis or they go to flaccid mortis. They go to rigor mortis because the, the patient's obviously dead, so there is no more energy to be, to be manufactured. There is no more ATP, so the muscles go into contraction. That's why they are stiff. So um, it's, it's a very important uh, aspect of uh, understanding the basics of um, uh, human phys physiology and circulation. So the, uh, this overall shaded area, so the stroke work as well as the potential energy that is stored in the actin and myosin uh, dictates how much energy the heart needs. And this is exactly what Dr. Talaj was mentioning that the ideal support once you know, it's supposed to be a device that brings down in this, pa in, in this uh, trajectory without changing the contractility. That is truly not available yet and probably n will never be. So for me as an interventional cardiologist, for or any interventional cardiologist, what's really important in, in, in the setting with QDMI is how much myocardial, ox myocardial oxygen consumption uh, the, the, the muscle that the heart needs. So the MBO2 uh, can be measured in two ways. You can measure the oxygen consumption per beat, which is for every beat how much oxygen the, how much oxygen the heart is going to utilize, and also per minute. But when it comes to per minute, it becomes much, much more important. That's where dotable time becomes important. That's why it's important to revascularize as quickly as possible. Because that's the time that the heart rate dictates how much energy the heart uh, requires. If you have a patient who has a baseline heart rate of 60 and goes into MI, they probably have a smaller amount of infarct size because the total myocardial oxygen consumption per minute is lower. As opposed to someone who has a heart of 140 because the heart has to work harder and faster. So the reason that we talk about this is and how it uh, is important to, to choose which mechanical uh, circular support is this. If you look into the components of the myocardial oxygen consumption, there are actually not that many. You need every muscle, every cell in the, in the heart requires some very, very basic element of uh, ATP just to maintain the cell membrane, the mitochondria, the reticulum and the, and, 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 and the plasmic reticulum and the whole organelles inside the cell. So that's really minimal, but that's something that is required. Now remember that calcium plays a very important role in, in uh, just, uh, um, not just uh, cystic and acid, but also in depolarization and repolarization of the cell. They keep going in and out of the uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum. But that calcium cycling also is going to require a fair amount of oxygen. That's why your sodium calcium uh, exchange pumps are constantly working both in, at the, and also ryanodine uh, receptors which are working at the level of uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum. But once it, uh, the major important part of the uh, oxygen consumption really requires on actin myosin coupling and uncoupling. And the, the harder the heart has to work, the more energy the heart requires. So if we can reduce the preload, in other words, as we can make this heart smaller and smaller and smaller, then the oxygen consumption becomes less and less and less. One of the, if you go back into the history of management of QDMI back into 1930s, 1940s, remember that at the, in those times, especially I think Mass General was one of the pioneers in, in the field, uh, the most important treatment was six to eight weeks of bed rest in a chair. And the reason that they used to use chair instead of bed was that when, when, when the patient sits in the chair, it pulls the blood down by gravity. So they were basically using mechanical solutions by, by using gravity to reduce the preload inside the left ventricle by which they could reduce the myocardial and oxygen consumption.
And then nitroglycerin also does the same thing. The reason that nitroglycerin works in patients who have angina, and again, oftentimes people think that the uh, coronary arteries become larger, which is true, but it has absolutely zero flow on the flow to the myocardium. The flow to the myocardium doesn't change at all. You can give all the nitroglycerin in the world, the flow of the myocardium remains completely constant because it's not dependent on, on, on nitroglycerin. But the reason that the angina goes away is that the EDB goes down, the preload goes down, to, so the wall stress goes down, which is the most important determinant of um, oxygen consumption in the blood. Now, when it comes to the afterload, it's exactly the opposite. As the afterload goes higher and higher and higher, the oxygen consumption goes higher and higher and higher. Again, by the laws of logic, and you can see that if someone's blood pressure is 100 versus another patient who has exactly the same amount of disease and has a blood pressure of 160, the one who has blood pressure of 160 has higher risk of having angina, assuming that they have coronary artery disease. Again, because the wall stress is higher on the heart. And lastly, it's about the, also about contractility. The higher the contractility, the more the oxygen consumption, and obviously the opposite if the contractility becomes less and less and less. Again, going back to the point that Dr. Talaj mentioned that if you can bring the, in the ideal pump, or in the ideal, ideal system, I should say, if you can bring down the overall curve back to the, back to the left side, then it the, the heart is resting more. So let me skip through this slide because this is essentially, um, I spoke about all of these. Again, going back to the point that the beat to beat MVO2 or oxygen consumption, myocardial oxygen consumption, if you measure beat to beat is the same, but if you go by the heart rate, then that's, where the difference comes into play. One of the reasons that we give beta blockers to patients who have angina is to reduce their heart rate. So by reducing the heart rate, you reduce the MVO2 and bioenergetics of the heart. So all of these things, what do they have anything to do then with the mechanical circuitry support? So the goals in acute heart failure and cardiogenic shock in the setting of acute MI, again, this is very different than the setting of chronic heart failure is to normalize hemodynamic profile by giving more or higher cardiac output, higher MAP, and there are ways to measure that. If someone comes in, in to the hospital with acute MI and cardiogenic shock, we always check lactate. Remember that uh, the setting that the patient has acute MI, like an inferior MI, and the patient is otherwise healthy, we, we don't even think about him. We don't think about details of hemodynamics and whether uh, the lactate is going up, uh, up or not, because in the uncomplicated ST elevation, or acute MI for that matter, it's the disease is all focused on the heart. But the very first, or the first few slides that Dr. Talaj showed had a very, very important bullet point that he highlighted at the very bottom that it's all about perfusion. When you have a patient who is in cardiogenic shock, then you talk about the entire body. It's not about the heart anymore. That's why we don't, I personally don't, unfortunately we, in, in the state of Alabama, we're, we're prisoners of Blue Cross Blue Shield, so we still have to think about door to balloon time. But the only number that actually doesn't matter at all in a patient who comes in with acute MI and cardiogenic shock is door to balloon time. I don't care if my door to balloon time is six hours as long as I have good hemodynamics and I'm uh, providing the right device for the right patient, that's all that matters. I can open the vessel later. And there are actually studies that uh, are coming into, uh, into our uh, uh, institution as well, and I'm gonna touch about that in, at the end of the study. So LV unloading then becomes the fundamental uh, core of a patient in cardiogenic shock and acute MI which is defined as a reduction of total mechanical power expenditure. Again, that area that Dr. Talaj mentioned, and you, you see that by, by the pressure volume curve, but also the potential energy that is still left in the heart. I'd like to talk about this um, animal study, but this is a fascinating study. And uh, this is one of those studies that has been, uh, unfortunately, um, again, un underappreciated until about five years ago. In this uh, study, the investigators uh, did a very elegant uh, experiment. They had a series of animals with intentional ligation of the LAD to induce myocardial, myocardial lung function. So what they did is that they unloaded the heart before the reperfuse. They unload the, unloaded the heart 
at the time of ischemia reperfusion and after they reperfuse. What was amazing is that if you unload the heart before you reperfuse, you reduce the area of infarct significantly, as opposed to if you do it at the time or after. One of the criticisms that Dr. Talash had about the shock, um, IABP shock 2 trial was that 92% of the, of the uh, cohort, both in the control or balloon pump, received the device after the PCI was done, and that's a legitimate concern. So what are the pathways that we can achieve these goals? One of which, as uh, we always do, is pharmacology, inotropic agents and pressors. And the other pathway is devices. So let's look into the, um, I'm not gonna go into the details of the papers. Every paper has strengths and uh, weaknesses. It doesn't matter which device. Uh, there is really no good, um, truly good and very well exited randomized con control trial on any of the dev devices, but we're gonna touch upon a couple of those. But uh, let's go one by one. First off, these devices are different and they work differently and every single one of them may be the right device for the right patient at the right time. So I cannot tell you which device is the best. In some patients, balloon pump, in some patients, VA ECMO, in some patients, tandem heart, and in some patients, uh, Impella. But uh, one word of caution is about uh, pharmacologic agents. I just spent a good uh, 15, 20 minutes talking, going through the preload, afterload, the elements of uh, uh, myocardial arsenic consumption from heart rate to everything else. When you look into all the pharmacologic agents, either inotropes or pressors or a combination of, uh, of both, you see that they almost always invariably increase the heart rate they almost always increase the uh, SVR with the exception of mirinone, and both of which we just talked about that they are going to, by default, increase the oxygen consumption, and therefore they, you would have larger size of infarct, and it's been proven. In fact, there are studies that uh, has shown, and I'm gonna touch upon uh, one of those, uh, that has shown that uh, the more inotropes and pressors the patient require, the higher the likelihood of mortality. The problem with those studies is that, again, none of those are randomized controlled. And you can assume that someone who requires three pressors is obviously sicker than the patient who doesn't require any pressor. So whether this is bias or not, probably, but at least the signal is the wrong signal. But on top of that, when you, uh, so, um, one disclosure that I probably should put here, this is from Harvey App. I have, I'm not being paid by this, but all of these uh, pressure volume curves, is, this is all simulation uh, coming from harvey.online. Uh, and Dr. Daniel Burkhoff, who's a good friend and uh, my mentor, um, is actually the founder of this. So when you look into uh, the uh, way that the inotropes and pressors work is that because of the increase in uh, contractility, the pressure volume area would be larger. So this is in the opposite direction that you wanna go. And because it increases the uh, peripheral resistance or systemic vascular resistance, overall the afterload would be higher. Both of which we just talked about, uh, they may have detrimental effect on the heart. More importantly, as the heart rate goes up, the slope of your MVO2 goes higher. All of these are not exactly what you want to achieve in the setting of acute MI and cardiogenic shock. That's why we try to avoid them if we can, and obviously I use it all the time. If my patient needs epinephrine, norepinephrine, melanone, dubidamine, I use it. But we, we try to use them very judiciously, cautiously, and in the right patient, in the right setting. So um, balloon pump, um, as Dr. Uh, Talaj mentioned, has an impact of somewhere between half a liter to at one liter is really uh, being very generous um, in, in the setting of cardiogenic shock. That's why a lot of people now have changed the, uh, the IABP uh, stands for intraortic balloon pump counterpulsation. Now people has, have changed it recently to intraortic balloon placebo because every single trial that we've looked into, truly randomized controlled trial, in high-risk PCI, in anterior acute ST elevation MI, which is 
as bad an MI as it can ever get. And also in, in cardiogenic shock, they all have been just as good as placebo. Now, uh, again, no randomized controlled trial is ever perfect. It's never going to be perfect. It doesn't matter how we design them. There is always uh, crossover and contamination. That's just the nature of the game of any randomized controlled trial. But it has never been proven in, rat in RCTs to be effective. Nevertheless, what it does is that it, it, it certainly has an impact of wedge and certainly has a small impact on cardiac output. This is truly an elegant paper from uh, Naveen Kapoor, another very good friend, um, who uh, has looked into the LVAD patients who, or LVAD or LVAD candidate patients who went on balloon pump. And this is the key to choosing balloon pump for the right patient. So if you think, again, if you think about the way that the mechanism of action in balloon pump, balloon pump goes up during diastole. So even the name of the balloon pump is intra aortic balloon pump counter pulsation. The patient has to be able to generate a stroke volume to counter pulsate and give it back to the body. If the patient has a stroke volume of 15 cc's, which is in full-blown cardiogenic shock, what's left to counter pulse? There is nothing there. So that's why, that, that's probably one of the reasons that every time that we look into truly randomized controlled trials with balloon pump, especially in shock patients, we never see even a signal of benefit. In the setting of acute MI, again, this is different than chronic heart failure. Everything that I'm talking about is a completely different patient subset. As opposed to uh, the principles of hemodynamics in patients, uh, the, the flow, uh, um, um, based uh, uh, mechanical circuitry supports, uh, such as uh, that in includes Impella and um, Tandem Heart, to some degree uh, ECMO as well, it's exactly the opposite. In the, uh, in the continuous flow devices, as the uh, patient's, uh, patient's heart becomes sicker and sicker, the, heart, the, the device becomes more and more effective. And this is a, f a very basic formula that we can look into that the device flow depends on the, obviously, how many times, how, how many revs per minute you have, divided by diastolic pressure minus e in, in uh, the LVDP. And as you can see, these are just examples of we put here in, from this paper. But uh, as the uh, denominator becomes smaller and smaller and smaller, the device becomes more and more and more effective, which is exactly the opposite of balloon pump. It doesn't mean that balloon pump should never be used. I just used it one about two days ago because that was the right setting for that patient. But we have to understand how we're choosing our patient. Again, going back to the point that Dr. Talaj mentioned, patient selection is the most important fundamental piece of this puzzle. So. If you want to look into the pressure volume curve of um, uh, a device like, uh, like Tandem Heart, which is uh, left atrial, uh, left atrial um, in, uh, input uh, to uh, aorta, LA to AO, you can see that it reduces, it increases the blood flow and cardiac output because it's giving the uh, flow, in, again, directly back to the aorta and reduces the wedge pressure at the same time. Now, um, if this goes forward. Okay, what's the difference between a device? Because when you look at, if you look at a patient who has cannula in the, in the common femoral vein and common femoral artery, it's somewhat difficult uh, to figure out whether this is um, tandem heart or, um, or uh, VA ECMO. The main difference between VA ECMO and uh, tandem heart is that VA ECMO does exactly the opposite. Not only does it increase afterload, the same way that tandem heart does, but more importantly, it increases preload. Again, look at the pressure volume area. So it increases the preload, increases the afterload, makes it much more difficult for the heart to open. Dr. Uh, uh, Talaj had, a, had an elegant case example, a case uh, of a patient whose uh, aortic valve was not able to open at all. And um, because of the stagnant uh, of blood in the LV, the patient ended up with an, with an LV clot or something similar to that, I suppose, right? So um, that's a very important problem with VA ECMO if we leave it just like that. If we think that we're giving flow to the patient and that should be enough, that doesn't seem to be the case. So uh, VA ECMO, again, it doesn't mean that it's not effective. It's effective in terms of giving flow to the end organs but as long as you unload the LV, and there are mechanisms that we can do that. 
And this is the, uh, again, the uh, simulation on how it changes the uh, pressure volume area as well as the oxygen consumption. Clearly, it increases it, again, very, very bad for the heart. In general, VA ECMO should be reserved for a bridge to decision, bridge to transplant, or bridge to LVAD. I never want to put my patient who's just coming to the ER on ECMO unless the patient had a CPR or something else happened that we didn't have time to, to save the patient. Now, this is the impact of uh, hemodynamics of impella devices. It doesn't matter if it's 2.5, 3.5, 5.0, the higher the flow goes, the uh, more effective it becomes. And as you can see, in, the, in this particular um, uh, device, this is, I think, a, a, a simulation of 3.5 uh, or impella CP, you can see that the preload is reduced, the afterload is reduced, and now you're coming down on the pressure volume, or, uh, uh, pressure volume loop towards the lower left which is exactly where you want to be. That's why it reduces the work of heart. Now, how we can use VA ECMO in our favor in a patient who's in cardiogenic shock? And um, so um, uh, the, um, there is a system that we call it ECPELA. So uh, as Dr. Um, Talaj mentioned, you can put balloon pump. Uh, if the LV has enough uh, ejection fraction left in it that can open up the uh, aortic valve, if, if it has enough power to overcome the uh, aortic valve, then you can put the balloon pump and, and help the uh, LV to some degree. In patients who are sicker, you can actually put an impella, but obviously you don't want to go full force. You can put it at P3, P4, just enough to uh, reduce the... Um, LVT, LVDP, and then you don't have to deal with a patient that Dr. Tall just showed you two chest x -ray. One of One of the patients responded re relatively well to diuretics, but the other patient had a wide out long, and I don't know how salvageable uh, those patients would be eventually. So um, the dose dependence of unloading is also very important. Um, I didn't, I, in fact, I, I put it on and then I took it off. Uh, I had a patient who uh, received a mitral clip about uh, two months ago, uh, had a bad EF to begin with, EF of 20, 25% after mitral clip because we increased the afterload. The patient went into full-blown um, LV shock. The, L, the EF dropped to, if you're very, very generous, about five to 10%. And because of his bad LV, he also had bad uh, RV dysfunction and then went into biventricular shock. And we put the devices in the patient, but we waited long enough. I waited for roughly about eight days. And after resting the LV and RV for that particular patient, both of them came back. He, he was discharged with an, L, with an EF of 40% on the left side and virtually normal RV function. So the dose dependence of the uh, LV on loading is very important. And th th there is a lot of discussion and debate about this. Not everybody agrees without, um, with, with unloading when it comes to heart, so I don't want to uh, spend too much time on this. So in summary, with acute hemodynamic compromise and the setting of uh, myocardial insult, especially in a normal or relatively normal heart, then restoring uh, hemodynamics is very important. Minimizing LV filling pressure is important to reduce the size of infarct and also symptoms for the patient, as well as pulmonary edema and then other complications. And uh, Pharmacologic approaches increase the MVO2. It does not mean that they should not be used. They should be, they can be used. We will use it all the time. We use it all the time, but appropriately in the right setting for the patient. And direct MCS options seem to be uh, the new kid on the block. And I'm gonna uh, touch upon uh, DTU or door to onload uh, trial uh, very quickly. So these are the, um, major uh, balloon pump trials, of the top three is balloon pump versus essentially nothing, standard of care. And in, again, BCIS was uh, high risk uh, PCI, CRISP AMI, like I said, it's anterior ST elevation MI, and IABP shock tool was truly cardiogenic shock trial, never has been shown to be uh, uh, different. PROTECT2, uh, which actually uh, UAB was number two enroller in the, in the nation, uh, was uh, comparing Impella 2.5 to balloon pump in high-risk PCI. This is not cardiogenic shock patient. And it is true that at 30 days, the p-value was not significant, although it was, uh, there was a strong trend. I think the p-value as article was 0 0.09 or 0 0.08. But at three months, there was a stronger trend. And we also have to remember that that was the previous generation, and more importantly, it was 2.5. And more importantly, a lot of the centers 
were new to the device, there were a lot of vascular complications. Now, I'd like to talk a little bit about IMPRESS trial. Dr. Tlaj mentioned that, so I'm uh, gonna go through this quickly, but I just want you to know that this was a heavily underpowered uh, trial. These were all 100% STEMI with cardi truly cardiogenic shock, very sick patients. They were randomized to balloon pump versus Impella CP, which is, I mean, they say three and a half liters, but in reality, it's never more than 3.2. And they, uh, the primary endpoint was 30-day uh, mortality. And it is true, in both groups we had roughly about 55% per, per, per mortality. But it's important to note that 92% of the patients who came into this tri trial had cardiac arrest with over 20 minutes of CPR, up to 20 minutes median time of CPR before they received either device. Now, in my book, I think it doesn't matter if they're a pulmonologist, cardiologist, GI specialist, hepatologist, I think the worst complicated, the worst presentation for any disease is being dead. So when we talk about CPR, then it's a completely different animal because we're not talking about the heart anymore. We're talking, and we're not talking about, even talking about, in, even in the setting of a STEMI, it's not about cardiac ischemia. It's all about um, global ischemia. You're ischemic from brain down to the very last cell in your body, especially if you're going under 20 minutes of CPR. So I'm just gonna skip through these slides very quickly. So this is a Kaplan-Meier curve. So it's a little bit difficult for me to say that balloon pump is in effect, I'm, I'm sorry, Impella CP is just as good as, uh, because I hear this all the time now that, well, Impella uh, uh, failed to show any be benefit over balloon pump. Yes, but in what setting, in what trial, now, in, in, in what clinical scenario? Now remember that when you talk about CPR, the one thing that we, I, I haven't even had, uh, had enough time to talk about it, it, when you look into shock registry, uh, out of uh, the entire registry, as well as actually the clinical trial, shock trial as well, which was published back in 1999, 36% of patients who presented had biventricular shock. And we haven't even started talking about what, I mean, Dr. Talaj just alluded to a couple of devices, but you just mentioned them because it's a whole host of different uh, scenario and different devices. But when you talk about 92% CPR, you're, you're definitely dealing with RV failure. You can, you can completely uh, normalize the LV. If your RV is dead, there, you need preload to the LV to work. So um, we all have to look into IMPRESS trial by a little bit of a grain of salt. Now, the future directions of uh, uh, mechanical or MCS devices in the setting of MI is really fascinating. Based on not that one paper, but there are numerous animal studies now that have shown that if you unload the heart first in the setting of MI and then revascularize, and when I say unload, it's not immediate. If you unload for, um, apparently the, the, the dose of unloading is somewhere between 20 to 50 minutes. If you unload the heart and then revascularize, based on cardiac MRI studies and troponin leak, the um, size of infarct is smaller. So uh, we're hopefully in the next six weeks, we're gonna be one of the centers, uh, which will be part of the pilot study for DTU or door to unload time that we're bringing patients with anterior MI only, uh, no prior history of PCR or cabbage. They go, uh, if they come in with SC elevation, then they go under um, Impella for half an hour versus immediate revascularization. So everybody, 100% of patients get the uh, Impella. Half of them will wait for 30 minutes. The other half, we immediately open and we want to look into their uh, size of infarct by cardiac MRI. Thank you very much and sorry if I went over.